presence of function, as I said this morning when I introduced Brana, you have to have people that surround you that believe in the same principles that you do and that you can, without any reservations, simply make an assignment to that individual or those individuals and it will be done. And I'll tell you, I don't know of a man that I have greater respect for than for Ed Graff. He's a very patient man. He's one that can analyze an issue fairly, without any partiality, listen to a disagreement between two people there in the office, and then come down with a decision that nearly without exception will be acceptable to both parties because he's been able to negotiate and work out a satisfactory arrangement. Ed has been working in the organization much longer than I, and, and I'm still learning from people like Ed and many of you. Invaluable. And his title now, as you know, reading the outline, is Chief Assistant to the President. This means if we have an assignment where two people uh, are needed or where the President can't go, that Ed or Bob or I go in and sit in and accept that uh, assignment and discharge the duty as though it were speaking for the President. He has full authority to speak for the President. We discuss most issues, and then going out on assignment, he represents the President and has been received well in the areas where the organization is, where the members are. He's been received well in testimony, hearings, debates, and other issues that he has represented you in. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you the Chief Assistant to the President, Ed Graff. Ed? Thank you very much, and thank you, President Woodland, for those comments. I guess maybe I have to apologize for being late. Uh, I walked in the door and said, you've been introduced. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my address this afternoon to the national directors and the officers, staff, and the delegates and friends here, I'm in entirely in a different position, of course, than I was or have been in the past 14 years working strictly with the dairy department. Um, as I walked in the first morning of the convention, I think I recognize that I saw more young people at this convention than I've seen in perhaps conventions for the last 10 years. And I know as it gets late in the convention like this and some of the people are anxious to get home, I felt very good about seeing those and I want to compliment you. I want to compliment you because this organization was built by the people you look around and see ball heads on them, the bags under the eyes, and who have now reached a point are saying to you, take this organization over and use it. It will never get a dime more for the milk I produce because I don't produce any more milk. But it's something that's been built by the other half of the people that need to be complimented too. To the young people, where would you be had those Old timers not built it. And where will it go if you don't take hold of it now? So I think it's just fine and time and right that we have a right to compliment each other because it took a lot of working together by a lot of people to be where we are today. Yesterday in the dairy meeting, they courteously, courteously asked me to come up and say a few words 
which I was happy to do, but I said, you come tomorrow, and I'm going to give you a different type of an address than you've ever heard me give before. <clears throat> There's a reason for why I'm going to say what I'm going to say to each and every one of you right now. And I want all of you to look me right in the eye. I like you. I won't comment on that till a little later in the speech. And you'll see how important it is. And you know what I'm going to do today? I'm, give, I'm going to give you the answer to every problem that you have in the NFO. Now, what more could you ask than that? The, the assignment that President Woodman has given me has been very interesting and it's a great variety. And I said to him about a month ago, I'm really going to enjoy this convention because I don't have to do anything. I'm going to the meetings, I'm going to sit and listen. I did that. But he assured me that I wouldn't get out of it that easy. But as I sat and listened to those meetings yesterday, I can honestly tell you that I never felt as proud of the leadership that I saw in the last 14 years since I've been director of the dairy department. And I'll tell you why. I never had the opportunity to sit in the back of the room and to listen and recognize the technical ability they have and how they're prepared to lead this organization. And perhaps I didn't recognize before the two segments as much as I should have in collective bargaining. Not one side of this organization can work. The bargaining technicians, as you heard, can do nothing without the collectiveness, and that's you. And the two of them together cannot be defeated. All you have to do is check history. You cannot be defeated. I'd like to make a few comments about what I saw yesterday and hope you saw the same thing. Devon has talked some about this survey that was made, and there are two parts of that that I think, uh, that I know, are the, really the only two parts that we should be concerned with right now. It's rather hard to follow speakers from the grain department. Speaking of Frank Kraft, Jack Lawson, Ray Jerkison, Art Schwerz, and others that I may not mention, because technically they know what it takes. In meat, Walt Hackney, Andy Nutzling, Merle Sunken, Mr. Hammond, all the people that represent the various departments in that, or the divisions, and in Derry with Al Scott, and Mr. McCarty, Ted Strait, specialties, Tim Ennis, because they know what their one specific duty is. They're responsible to you to, to make collective bargaining work. The ability of John Huffman, Homer Alley, Chuck Frazier. I'm going to make a comment on something on Chuck Frazier that happened perhaps 12 years ago that I wonder how many of, in this room recognize what that Washington office and Chuck Frazier did for this organization. Maybe he's forgotten it. I'd like to comment on that. And of course then Bob Arndt, the Vice President and President Woodland. There may not be much for me to say other than to recap a few of the things. I thought Andy Nutzling's comment that must concern you at times when you're home in your own counties, why aren't we growing faster? Are we growing fast enough? Where do we stand? But I know that Andy told some of you, if you were a grandparent, 
and you hadn't seen your grandchildren for two years, and you came back, what's the first thing grandparents say? My gosh, how you've grown. And you recognize that. But if you live with that child every day, you don't recognize how they're growing, do you? That's an ex excellent example. Now, we've been doing something wrong, in my opinion. We're talking too much about how bad things are. Do you really honestly believe that the non-member of this organization needs you or wants you to come in and tell him how bad things are? All he's got to do is pick up the paper, read about it. All he's got to do is get his bills and pay them. What are we telling them when we go in and tell them how bad it is? He already knows that. How surprised do you think they'd be if we came in and told them how good it is? You think you can't do it? Under image, which covers many things. I don't know what President Woodland, how deep he went into that, but image causes, it covers a lot of things. Under image, there are two things that the people surveyed are concerned about. One is, are you effective? That's part of image. Are you effective? Well, let me ask you. Just a few things I picked from each commodity. If I told you that at the experimental farm in the state of Wisconsin, they shipped I think it was seven, eight, or nine heifers to a packer that has bought them for years. But because there was a friend of or a relative of an NFO member there said, why don't you try the NFO? And after all deductions on this somewhere between six or eight heifers, they netted, I believe it was plus $600 more. Would you say that's being effective? Did you know that there's another man reported to me in the state of Wisconsin that sold 300 and he thought there was a mistake on his check? A mistake of about $10,000. There was no mistake. It's because they went through the NFO. Did you hear that the farm director called Howard Fisher in and said, why do you get more than anybody else? Is that being effective? When three, three or four counties in northeastern Iowa, the lowest priced area in the nation on hogs because a hog uh, killer had shut down his line and the first six processors knew the farmer was sitting out there, couldn't do anything about it. NFO went in there, got the people together, they asked us to come in, come out with a dollar a hundred over the interior Iowa market. With hogs moving from western Iowa right through that area, bringing more money because they were alone, they couldn't help themselves. Isn't that being effective? You heard if you went to the feeder cattle department where they could have been contracted for 80 cents, but the producer was uncontra uncontractable. He thought they'd go higher, so they sold them for what, 65? Sheep offered 60 cents. Individually, they thought they'd go higher. What did they sell for, 42? Why are we not able to get the tremendous market that we have out there, 70% of the farmers want what you've got. I'm going to tell you why. There was something that happened in this past year. I don't know how many of you heard about it. It was in the meat department in some negotiations on cattle or hogs or something. I think it was cattle, where the buyer said, 
to our meat representative, whatever you do, don't get rid of the dummies. Who do you think the dummies are? Who do you think the processor says the dummies are? They're the people that take their cattle to the auction barn. They're calling them dummies. But don't you call that farmer a dummy. Not going to help you. But that's how you're looked upon by the processor today. Largest block of cows for sale every morning, every Monday morning in the nation by the national farmers. In milk, I wonder how important it is to the buyers today to recognize that what we said 15 years ago, we're not going to go into business and compete with you. Why was it that in the dairy meeting yesterday, when they asked for comments from the area directors and the regionals, I noticed Joe Paris, one problem, we need more milk. Why did the Wisconsin unit the heaviest dairy producing area in the, in the United States. Simply say, we need more milk. Why is the industry coming to the NFO when they know we want cost of production? That problem has been solved. The problem of the buyers. Jean Paul's area the same way. We need more milk. In specialties, Tim Ennis. I believe he has the largest block of sunflowers, producer owned sunflowers in the nation. If you heard what Tim said yesterday and recognize it, he gave you an example of having a force greater, a force greater than, a force greater than gravity. I'm old enough, many of you are, to remember when you saw an airplane flying over, you ran out of the house, you called all your rest of your family out, said, look, an airplane. It should have fallen to the ground, but it didn't. I don't know how many million people watched what Tim was talking about, defying the law of gravity, going out of it, coming back to it. One day, it will be as common for agriculture to establish their prices as it is for an airplane to fly today. All I'm going to do is tell you how to get there quick, and I guarantee you it'll work. I wanted to thank you for the contribution you made to GRIP yesterday. I remember as a newly elected national director, a statement that I made. I said, if this organization ever goes to a political organization, I'm through with it. I suppose I ought to qualify that to some extent now, because I'm going to point out something to you that had we not been in Washington, D.C., what would have happened to every dairy farmer in the United States? And some of the board of directors are going to remember what I'm talking about. Maybe some of you will. Chuck Fraser gave the board of directors an example the other day of the fight that he's up against on our status with IRS. And he had nothing to work with, really, nothing to fight with other than his ability. He didn't have funds to work with. And I was glad he said what he said the other night. He said, either get in and help, or let's drop it. And thanks to you, you came through. We don't have to drop it. But I'll tell you how important it is. I wonder how many of the board of directors remember the night that Orrin Lee Staley got a call from Chuck Fraser. I think it was about midnight, after we thought the farm bill was completely worked on and agreed upon, 
And Chuck said, get your board of directors into Washington tomorrow morning just as fast as you can. Any of you directors remember that when we went to Washington, see the hands come up? That board of directors that was called in that day and briefed by Chuck Fraser and what had to be done were assigned to senators to see them, to stop an amendment that had been added to the farm bill after we thought it was all finished. And that amendment would have made every dairy farmer in the United States check off five cents a hundred from your milk to be, to be put in the coffers of the cooperatives who tried to stop the NFO. Had Chuck Fraser not been there, there would not have been, in my opinion, an NFO dairy department today. You couldn't have fought them. And let me tell you the strength we had that day. I'll tell you who I was assigned to. I was assigned to George McGovern and Mr. Huddleston. I believe he's from Kentucky, is that right? And I don't know who these fellows were assigned to. But we did go to their offices and we talked to them. And we had power. We laid down, I remember of head of uh, Mr. Huddleston, the copy that I had of the contributions that he had received in order to get that amendment attached. And we were nationwide and we said, if you approve that in the Senate, you can be sure we're going back and tell all of your constituents how it was done. It was done with money. And do you know that that amendment was defeated so bad in the Senate that Hubert Humphrey came to the, in the corridor after the vote had been taken, and I quote his words, for God's sake, Orrin Lee, give us something. That's how powerful that group was that went to Washington, D.C., and if it hadn't been for Chuck Fraser, we wouldn't have even known it. That's why Chuck has to be there to watch what happens that could destroy everything we've worked for. I hope you recognize that. I'm sure you do, or you wouldn't have come through last night. I might say that you listen to W.C. Bennett from the Independent Bankers. I don't know if Mr. Pat Du Bois spoke from this podium or not. He did not. He was a past president. I met with him. He has already said, give us a call as soon as you can. I'm calling the bankers together to meet with the NFO. That's a little different, isn't it? I can tell you what I told him. I said, I think it's high time with the situation that we got in this country that we forget, that we better start forgetting about not wanting to speak out and tell some of the people that borrow from you they better listen to programs that are going to keep them on the farms. He agreed with me, too. If Doris McElwain is here and Bob Mankey, they were both sitting in on that meeting. Well, the survey said 70% of the people want collective bargaining. Now, that's 70% of the people we need. Do you remember when we talked about 30%? We wondered if we could get it. My brother said to me one day, Ed, do you really think you can get 30%? I said, yes. I said, I think we can get three out of 10 farmers that believe in, want, and need collective bargaining. I was way off. There's 70% of them can be gotten. Our fight is not with the industry anymore. Our fight is with ourselves. Us happen to be our worst enemy. No doubt about it. 
Number one is you are effective, and we're going to tell the world how effective we are. Those of you who remember Butch Swain, <coughs> remember his statement, you sell the sizzle, not the steak? Any of you remember Butch? That's what he used to say. You remember another thing he said? People like to do business with people that are doing business. They don't want to do business with losers. We've been acting like losers. We have 800,000 farmers in this country and ranchers that when the study was made by the last Secretary of Agriculture, Bob Berglund, found out that they're in trouble. Now these are the farmers that you drive along the highway and you probably see five harvesters, a couple of big combines, several big machine sheds. And now on your way home, look for one thing. Look the kind of a house he's living in. Just watch it. It's not quite comparable to the harvesters and the buildings and the machinery that he has. But they're the people that we drive by and they look like the prosperous, well-to-do, well-managed, up-and-coming farms. Well, I attended a meeting in Des Moines about two months ago and I admired Bob Berglund, what he, what he said. He was introduced and said, something about, well, you represent these farmers out here, and the guy kind of chuckled, and he said, yeah, these farmers that uh, are millionaires. And when Bob Berglund talked to them, he said, those farmers are not millionaires. They're just millions in debt. And he said, that's the ones you better be concerned about. But I'm going to even though they're in trouble, they don't like you to tell them so. They know it. They don't want you to tell them so. And we need them, so how do we get them? They're proud people. There's very few of them come to you and say, we're in trouble. That's the last thing they want to say to you. Do you think they want you coming to them and telling them they're in trouble? When they go to bed at night and they're alone, that's when they start to think about their troubles and they're not sleeping so good anymore. They're the 70% that we want. So you may not like what I say next, but who's to blame that we're not growing faster? I'm to blame and so are you. We are to blame for not growing faster. Walt said from this podium yesterday, you are the top people in the world as far as producing because you're trained and you know how. He also said you're probably the worst pilots he's ever seen. And I'll guarantee I'm not going to get in a plane with most of you if you're going to fly it. I believe Walt, and I'll give you another hint, don't get in one that I'm going to fly. Maybe we are the poorest salesmen in the country too. Do you ever believe that you're being outsold in the country when you've got something that 70% of the people want and you can't give it to them? You can't sell it to them? It doesn't say we're the best. How accurate is this survey? I don't know if Devon said that or not. They guarantee us they are 96% accurate. So all we got to do is listen, and then we've got to find a way to get those people. I've had the opportunity to take some courses in management and sales recently and one time in Indianapolis. I tried to think of that, where that was. It was in Indianapolis. And some of the people at this convention were there, and the course co was conducted by Tom Norman. Is there anybody here who remembers coming to Indianapolis? Sure, all around the country, or all around here. 
I think it was held in the Holiday Inn. And I remember one thing he always told us. He said, I don't care what you're selling or what you're doing, the person that you're talking to, you have to let him let the air out of his balloon. Remember him saying that, Myron? Ted Strait, I believe it was Ted, since he's been studying and trying to learn how to sell, and they're highly successful, there's no doubt about that, they've been effective, has also said, most of us go out and we argue. We don't sell, we argue. I said 15 years ago, and I remember a specific meeting, I'm sure Steve Pavich from Wisconsin remembers it, it was up in his area, we had CMPC, we had AMPI, I don't know how many people we had. Representing the panel, I was on the panel for NFO. I believe it was up near Thorpe or Stanley. And the room was filled. 